In this presentation, we're going to look at what is referred to as the Ferris Lindquist effect and talk a little bit about its, its effects on total periphery systems. This is the initial observation that was made by Ferris and Lindquist. They looked at the measured viscosity through a viscometer tube as it related to the hematocrit. And they found that as the hematocrit increased that the viscosity did too, which is what would be predicted. They wanted to find out if this had the same effect if they used the hind limb of a dog in replacement of the viscometer tube. And so they ran the experiment again. And for each hematocrit, they found that the measured viscosity was less. They uh, could only explain this by assuming that it had something to do with the actual diameter of the various tubes, since the hind limb of a dog has tubes of a number of caliber. They thought they would use a viscometer and gradually decrease the diameter of the viscometer tube and see if that affected relative viscosity. And when they got between about 200 and 300 microns in diameter, they found that the viscosity or the measured viscosity was decreasing. And that continued to go down. It looked like it was projecting down towards uh, 1.5, which is the plasma viscosity. Uh, they weren't able to run the experiments down that low. And so they said that there's something happening with in the smaller vessels that is causing this apparent decrease in viscosity. Now if you look at blood as it's flowing through a small vessel, you'll notice that there's this area out here that is free of red cells because they're too large to be running right against the cell wall or the vascular wall and so they're forced inward. That means that the resistance, which is the interaction between the wall of the vessel and the fluid is caused by this thin layer. And since this is primarily plasma, the viscosity is closer to plasma, which is 1.5. But we still have this very large bulk of cells, which is contributing to that. And this is another representation of that. Again, you can see how the red cells are moving centrally. And so if you did an overall hematocrit, the total hematocrit across the, the, the vessel is going to be the same. However, if you looked at hematocrit at various areas, you'd find out that the hematocrit would be highest centrally. This is a picture taken from the microcirculation. This is a vein, and this is a small arterial. And now for reference and size, this large structure right here is actually a white cell. And so you can see that the cells are moving very rapidly. But just barely along the side of the wall, you can see that it's slightly paler, meaning that there's no cells there. And you can see the endothelial cells, so this is a small capillary, or a small arterial. Maybe these are smooth muscle cells. And again, the same thing. You can see the endothelial walls and probably some smooth muscle walls, uh, muscle cells out here. But again, it looks like there is a decrease in the hematocrit or an increase in plasma between the flowing stream and the actual wall of the vessel. When you get the smaller vessels again, these can't crowd together very much. And so this uh, phenomena does not continue on as you go down to the capillaries or even the very small vessels. But it does take place in those vessels which are most involved with resistance. And again, this is another artist's representation of the same thing where you have these cells moving centrally and this layer of plasma between the wall of the small vessel and the, uh, the center of the stream. This then represents a capillary. And you'll notice that the cells are pretty much having to deform in order to get through there. 
the capillaries are typically about six to seven or maybe eight microns in diameter, while the red cells are eight microns in diameter. So you'll see that some of these are actually deforming in order to move through. And here's a picture of uh, the red cells moving through a capillary. And you see that they're really having to scrunch in order to get through that. The reason that all of this is important is as you look at the pressure drop across the vasculature, the greatest drop in pressure is the area where the resistance is the highest. And so we have this area here where we have a very large drop in pressure. And it happens to be those same vessels where we have the Ferris Lindquist effect taking place. So if we did not have the Ferris Lindquist taking place, then the viscosity in these vessels would be higher and it would cause an increase in pressure and be harder to get blood through that. It would be like the difference of perfusing the vasculature with honey versus perfusing the vasculature with water. In situations where the hematocrit is above 60, this does begin to cause problems. You can get increases in blood pressure. You have de decreased peripheral flow, even though you have a lot of hemoglobin and the ability to carry oxygen, we can't get it to the tissues because of the blood moving so sluggishly through them. Again, this is the Ferris Lindquist effect. It's the result of the red cells moving centrally in the smaller vessels and giving us a less or a decreased hematocrit as compared to what we would expect at that point. I hope this has been helpful.